Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explorer Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. Really excited to be catching up with Paul Salopak today on his Out of Eden walk. Uh, but before we catch up with Paul, we're going to take a minute and we're going to use National Geographic Mapmaker Interactive, and we're going to take a look at where some of our groups are joining us live for today's Hangout. So if you bear with me for one moment, I'm going to share my screen. All right, and now you should see the map. So we've got myself joining us in uh, Laura, Ontario. And as I back out, we're going to start seeing some of the classrooms come into focus. So we have classrooms from Orangeville, Vaughan, and West Sutton joining us in Ontario. And if I continue to back out, you'll see we have some classrooms in Connecticut as well as New Jersey. And we'll go out even further to find classrooms in Calgary, Alberta, and San Diego, California joining us today. And in fact, if I slide across the Pacific. I was hoping for a better walking image, but, mm -hmm. uh, oh, and it didn't even stay on the map, but we have Paul joining us uh, somewhere in Northern India, and I'm sure he'll talk a little bit more about that when we get started. So let's bring it back. All right, you should see me now. So as mentioned, really excited to be joined by explorer Paul Salopek. He's a writer and journalist. He's traveled to more than 50 countries and earned most of America's top print media awards, including Pulitzers for his reporting on human genetics and the Civil War in the Congo. He's currently walking across the world for a decade-long storytelling project called the Out of Eden Walk. As mentioned, this is quite a walk, quite a bit of slow journalism, meeting people along the way and documenting and sharing their stories. We've had the pleasure of connecting with Paul multiple times on his journey, including a couple days ago. Paul, it's so great to have you joining us again today. Joe, it's great to be with you in all the classrooms. It looks like most of you in North America. Uh, great to be chatting with you today. All right, well, Paul, I know, um, some might be unfamiliar with uh, what you're up to. So let's first start off. Why don't you give us just a little brief synopsis of the Out of Eden walk, and then maybe I'll share my screen and we can go through a little bit of the last few months. Sure. Um, yeah, so basically my project is a storytelling project. And you know, bear with me, those of you who, who are following along already. Um, but back in 2013, after, after spending many, many years as a foreign correspondent, uh, covering the world for uh, an American newspaper, uh, the Chicago Tribune, and writing for magazines, I decided to slow myself down and begin covering the world the way the human beings that, who first migrated out of Africa discovered the world, which is on foot. And I did that to try to slow my, my reporting process down, to try to slow down um, the way I interacted with people, um, to try to spend more time with people, to try to get inside of their lives, to try to get inside of their communities, and maybe tell stories that were a bit deeper, more original um, than many in our fast-paced uh, world today. So again, back in 2013, I set out from uh, an ancient fossil site in the Rift Valley of Africa and in the country of Ethiopia, and I walked north um, into the, uh, the Middle East, and then uh, headed uh, eastward across Turkey through Central Asia. Uh, and then now I'm, I'm talking to you from South Asia, from India, as Joe mentioned, um, from pretty much if you put a, a dart right in the dead center of India, I'm kind of right near the heart of India up in the north. Um, and about, I don't know, maybe 40% of the way through what will probably be a 10 or 11 year walk across four continents more than 30 countries, many, many time zones, dozens of cultures and languages, ultimately going all the way to the tip of South America, which scientists say is kind of the, the end point, at least in terms of the continents that our ancestors reached um, as they spread out from Africa back in uh, a period called the Pleistocene about 70 to 100,000 years ago. So again, telling stories as I go, mostly writing, I'm a writer, but I also take photographs, I shoot video, uh, and my project is primarily about people. You know, I write about the environment, write about things like climate change, um, I write about nature. Uh, I've been very privileged to see amazing uh, natural landscapes on these, these last five years of walking between Africa and India. Um, but my, my focus is primarily about us, you know, this 
endless mystery of who we are and where we've been and, and where we're going as we walk together into the 21st century with all of its challenges, right? So that's it in a nutshell. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much, Paul. So just a shout out to the viewers. I see we're starting to climb on YouTube. If you're a classroom, use the YouTube chat sidebar on the right. Let us know where you're watching from and send us in some questions. But for now, I'm going to share my screen uh, and Paul's going to be able to tell us about some of the pictures that come up. So for the classrooms who are on camera, now's the time to come up and click uh, my little box in the corner. It should turn white and you'll know that you're locked in. So here we go. Let's start this screen share. And we'll go full screen. And actually, I should make sure I lock it in for the YouTube viewers. There we go. So, Paul, does that look like it's coming up uh, on your end? It sure is, Joe. Yeah, that's Perfect. a good, you know, a decent map that kind of shows the, the rough routing of the project. And I have to remind my readers and also you students following along that these are very general sort of routes, right? They change in real time all the time. They've changed a lot already, depending on things like, you know, climate and, and, and physical barriers, but often politics too, right? Sometimes I have trouble getting visas into countries. And believe it or not, I have to walk around entire countries. Um, so um, I've been blown sideways on this trip quite a bit. But that is the general, that red line is kind of the general pathway of my project. And also, according to scientists, according to archaeologists and paleontologists, people who study um, our past, this is more or less one of the migration corridors out of Africa uh, to the very tip of South America there. Um, our ancestor did this, scientists estimate, in about 2,500 generations over across maybe 50,000 years. So people who think I'm, I'm really slowing down in today's age by taking 10 years of my life to do this, um, you just put it into perspective. <laughs> the original discoverers of the world uh, took much, much longer. So the last time uh, Joe and I spoke with many of you uh, was from Central Asia. I was, uh, I think the last time we did this, Joe, um, Barring just a couple of days ago, I was in the country of Kyrgyzstan, um, one of the Central Asian republics. And so I just wanted to show some pictures of, of the extraordinary landscapes of Central Asia. Um, this one is actually in Afghanistan. So what I did was I walked out of Kyrgyzstan across four major mountain ranges, the Pamirs, uh, the Hindu Kush, the Karakoram, and then back in the Kyrgyzstan, the Alai range as well. And what you're seeing there um, is just some of the gorgeous um, scenery of, of a very remote corner of Afghanistan called the Wahan Corridor, which, which I'm happy to talk about, take your questions about later. Afghanistan, as you guys know, is often in the news because there's a civil war there uh, that's been going on a long time. Um, international forces uh, are involved there, including American troops. Um, and I was there um, way back 16 years ago to cover the outbreak of the war. Um, on this project, this was my first return to Afghanistan, and it was a very, very different kind of a, a visit. Um, in a strange way, kind of a home, homecoming, um, because Afghanistan left such a strong impression on me 16 years ago, and a very, very different one. One that, that changed from war coverage into more like um, covering a, a, um, a very pristine alpine landscape inhabited by pastoral nomads, conducting a very um, old way of life. Next image. So more of the same. This also is in Afghanistan. Um, this is a beautiful uh, um, valley, part of the Wakhan Corridor. Um, you're, what you're looking at there, the tops of those mountains, right along the very rim of the tops of those ridges is the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan, right? So I'm standing in Afghanistan looking east um, into Pakistan, a country that I would um, be walking into, you know, weeks after this picture was taken by going over that same mountain range. Very beautiful part of the world. Next image. And this is an image of where I am now, just kind of how it's changed, right? Now I'm down in the Great River Plains of South Asia um, after having crossed um, the mountains of Central Asia, after having crossed 
what is essentially an extensions of the of the Himalaya, Himalaya mountains, the highest mountains in the world, right? That includes Mount Everest. Um, this is a city in India, uh, Jaipur, with very very classic, very um, famous architecture. Um, and you can see the landscape just looks much different. It's flat. It's much wetter. Um, and it's just much more subtropical here in India. Next image. Jumping around a little bit, this takes us back up into the mountains. Um, I just wanted to show you some of the method of travel that the Out of Eden Walk um, requires. Now, I, I walk with a rucksack. Um, I try to keep it pretty light. Because I'm a storyteller, because I'm a journalist, the majority of my weight um, is basically electronics, right? I'm using a small lightweight laptop to talk to you guys on right now. Um, I carry some equipment like, uh, you know, digital recorders. Um, I carry extra batteries, stuff like that. But occasionally when I'm, when I'm moving um, through very remote landscapes, um, I have to carry extra food and water. And that's when I, I um, travel with animal partners. And this is a picture of my uh, friend, uh, the National Geographic photographer, Matthew Paley, uh, feeding some bread, some biscuits to one of our two cargo donkeys in Afghanistan. This picture was taken up um, probably around, I want to say 4,700 meters. We're talking, you know, close to, what is that, like 14,500 feet. It's about, you know, up near the, near the top of this um, valley that is basically at the peak of Mount Whitney in California, the highest mountain in the United, continental United States. Very cold day. Uh, it had just snowed in a blizzard, and we had to cross even higher passes ahead along this route. Next image. This is a little later that same day, showing you how the weather really can be pretty tricky up at high elevations. We're climbing up over uh, a mountain pass from Afghanistan into Pakistan. Um, you know, sometimes the visibility was even worse than this. Um, that's, that's again, Matthew walking ahead with one of the donkeys. I'm, I'm leading another one uh, through snow that was up sometimes to our hips. And what was really difficult about this traverse was that the snow had buried the trails. We couldn't see um, where we were planting our feet. And if you plant your feet wrong, you could fall down a crack between the rocks or go rolling down the mountain. Uh, so we had to move very slowly and carefully. Um, believe it or not, this route that looks like the end of nowhere, that looks like, you know, Shangri-La, it looks like some place that uh, sees very little human traffic, is actually a trade route that goes back to centuries, to the Silk Road days. Um, and that during the summertime, when the weather is good, local nomads, ethnic Kyrgyz nomads, use this same pathway with yaks to go to Pakistan to get things like food and clothing and electronics and, and medicine. So we're trying to find their trail as we go over this, this mountain range in very bad weather. And this is the very top. We, we were rewarded, Matthew and I, uh, at the summit. Just before sunset, we had 30 minutes of, of good light when the, when the clouds uh, lifted. And that is, in fact, the summit. This is, this is literally the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. It's the middle of a wilderness. It's the middle of the Hindu Kush Karakoram mountain range. There is no road. There is no immigration checkpoint. There's no, you know, customs officer. It is just wild, beautiful, rugged mountains, as far as the eye can see. Next image. And that's just a picture of Matthew and I at that same spot, celebrating uh, having reached this kind of milestone in the journey. Um, I see it really that this mountain pass was kind of the end of Central Asia to me. And from here on now, I was rolling down glacial valleys into South Asia through Pakistan, uh, following big rivers that were filled with glacial melt that would eventually empty into the mighty rivers that you guys probably have heard of through your geography classes, uh, the, the Indus River um, that's, that is shared both by India and Pakistan. Uh, these mountain valleys, these glaciers feed into that river. Um, and now, again, this is kind of coming down from that, that high elevation to more or less the region that I'm in now. Um, this is uh, Rajasthan in India. And I've been walking through India for about five months. I've covered about more than 1,500 kilometers, maybe something like 1,800 at this point. 
Um, and that's one of my walking partners on the right. That's Bianca Borpujari talking to a mom who is taking care of a farm while the men are away um, um, working as migrant laborers. And what was interesting, the reason I'm showing this picture is that this farm and this region was inhabited mainly by women because the men had left to go work in the cities. And so you had kind of female societies who were taking charge and, and were making all the decisions about how to keep uh, these farms running. It was an interesting part of the trail. Next image. And this is just a uh, just kind of a pretty picture of, of the beautiful architecture here in India. India is one of the oldest civilizations in the world. It's, you know, it's contributed so much in terms of art and sculpture and music and, and religion and, and uh, storytelling. Uh, this is a this is a Haveli, uh, kind of an old trader's home in a small village, typical of kind of the, the communities that we've been walking through um, in, for the last several months um, through northern India. And I wanted to show this one just to show also to give due credit to my guides. You know, you saw Matthew uh, uh, and I at the top of the mountain. What's cool about this picture is that the figure in the blue and red is another female guide. You know, one of the great parts of the last stretch of the trail, say for over the last year and a half, is that I've been able to walk with women for a change. You know, it's been difficult um, coming uh, from through the Middle East, through parts of Central Asia, because they're, they can be um, very conservative rural societies uh, practicing Islam, where it's difficult for me to make connection with 50% of humanity, right? Because of gender barriers, cultural barriers between men and women. And this I wanted to show, um, this was an amazing young woman, uh, Furo, uh, who is Tajik um, from the Pamir Mountains. And she's uh, consulting with our donkey wrangler um, on a morning when our donkey escaped. <laughs> we woke up to that, that view out of our tents and our donkey was nowhere to be seen. And so we're trying to find a donkey again. Furo was 23 at the time. Um, she walked about 400 kilometers, around 240 miles with me through the Pamirs, most of it in sandals. She was tough. And this is just a picture to show that how my project is, even though I'm writing about current events, even though I'm writing about the people I meet, you know, in 2018, uh, it's rooted in history, right? Um, I look back to, you know, what happened in this spot that may have influenced current events today. Um, and so this is a picture of another mountain pass. This was back in Uzbekistan um, that was uh, part of the empire of Tamerlane. I don't know if you guys ever heard of Tamerlane, but he was one of the great emperors of Central Asia who, set, who just spread out, his army spread out and conquered big chunks of Eurasia. And, and they left these kind of monuments. You can see writing carved in the back on the back of this uh, stone. Is that it? I think Joe is there. I think that's it. Is there, yeah. Oh, there's a video. That's it for the slides. And that's just a, a typical day at the office, right? For me, that's the kind of a day that I have uh, on every given day, and especially the last few months walking through India. That was just all shot on the same day in a, in a short stretch of about 15 miles or 25 kilometers of the state of Rajasthan in India. So that's it for the audiovisuals. All right, well, thanks so much, Paul. I think it's time that we meet some of our classrooms and take some questions. The chat sidebar has been very engaged so far, so we will take some questions 
uh, from the YouTube chat sidebar. So a reminder to any classrooms, let us know where you're watching from and send in those questions. Uh, but for now, let's meet some of our classrooms. So we're gonna start off with Mrs. Whittington's group. They are joining us uh, from San Diego and they're our high school group. There's a mixture of different students. Let me turn their microphone on. Hello, I am sorry about my students. I explained this yesterday because of schedule, they have already left. They just left the class. They're in break now, moving to another class. But thank you very much. They love your presentation. We are very lucky to have you with us today. Thank you. Okay, and they were able to tune in. They enjoyed it. Yes, thank you very much. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, let's jump to our online community because we do have a classroom there queued up and ready to go. So there's a group joining us in Chicago. Um, looks like they're some fifth graders and they're wondering, do you collect any mementos during your walk? Yeah, interesting question. That's the first time anybody's asked me that. Um, normally I don't. Um, think about it. If you're walking across the world and all you have is a rucksack to carry stuff in, you can't really be um, collecting too many souvenirs. Um, so I generally don't. Um, I have surprisingly few. My main uh, uh, souvenirs are 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 these guys. If you can see them, right? It's my it's my journals. So I collect stories that at least physically don't weigh anything except the ink on paper. Um, occasionally a very special gift is given to me by somebody who I've become very close to in the course of the walk. Um, in that case, that gift has emotional value. And, and of course, then I would keep that. And those I, I, I send back, um, they're uh, being kept by a colleague uh, back in the States. Maybe eventually uh, by the end of the walk to be exhibited um, in some sort of a, you know, kind of a museum exhibit. All right, great question to start us off from the YouTube community. So let's jump to Mrs. Pearson's class. They are joining us uh, from Calgary, Alberta. We got some grade four and threes joining us. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, Calgary? How are you doing? Good. <laughs> hey guys. How cold is it in the mountains? How cold is it in the mountains? Okay. It, it, it got this cold that one day on top of a mountain pass, even wearing heavy snow pants, even laying inside of a sleeping bag, even putting that sleeping bag inside of a tent, my clothes still froze on me. That's how cold it was. So it was really, really cold. That was a night that I didn't get much sleep, as you might imagine. Good question. All right, another shout out to you two. We've got some fourth graders in Albuquerque, New Mexico joining us. So don't forget to send us in uh, a question. We also have someone joining us in Vermont and there's some questions coming in. So we'll get some of those questions as well. But let's go to a new live classroom. This time we'll go to Mr. Sanisi. He is in Vaughan, Ontario with some grade 11 students. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, grade 11s? Hi. Yeah. Hi, we're good. Hi. Hi. Um, so I know there were a lot of like landslides recently in India. Were you affected by that on your journey? Yeah, no, I, I was out of the mountains by the time those uh, slides came in. Um, so fortunately, I, I was not affected by them. You know, as, as climate changes uh, in this part of the world, it, it affects a lot of things. I mean, it's also a very earthquake prone part of the world. Um, I don't know if you might be aware, but back in 2015, earthquakes, you know, destroyed big parts of Nepal and, and many, many, many people died. Um, again, I was very lucky um, that I did not get caught in an avalanche. I did not get caught in a mudslide, um, but I walked over parts of that landscape where it had just recently happened and where it was pointed out to me, there'd be like a fresh gash in the side of a mountain, just, you know, raw stone, where the previous year or two, there had been a village and it was just completely swept away. So it's pretty, pretty sobering. All right, another quick shout out to a few more viewers. Let's see. Um, and we'll take one of their questions as well. So this is, 
Where did they go? There we go. From Santa Fe, New Mexico, the New Mexico Junior. So welcome. Don't forget to send us in some questions. And to take another question from the online community, what's your motivation to keep moving forward, even when things are tough, whether it's border complications or weather? What keeps you going? Yeah, that's another another great question. You know, I don't think I'd be able to do this project. I don't think I'd even be, be talking to you from India today if I didn't have sort of the the um, push of a mission behind it. And that push is storytelling. And it, you know, it sounds like a pretty frail hook to hang your hat on, but stories really give shape to our lives. And after five and a half years of doing this, this journey has become my life. This is what I do now. It's not a, a holiday. It's not a, you know, it's not even work anymore. It's just, it's, it's my life. I wake up to it every day. I'm, I'm immersed in the story of the journey. Um, and the journey has given me kind of a prism, a, a, a keyhole to look at the world that gives me this great privilege to um, ask questions and deploy my curiosity. And I think if I didn't have that, that even on tough days when, you know, I just mentioned being frozen one morning on a mountain pass in, on the Afghan-Pakistan border or being stuck by visa, you know, bureaucracy in other countries being frustrated and stymied if i didn't have this kind of shining road of narrative ahead of me giving giving my journey and my life direction and purpose i don't think i could continue but i have that and that kind of is the um the wind at my back if you will that keeps me walking all right a great question We'll go to another one of our live classrooms. This time, Mrs. Pratt's classroom. They are joining us from um, Sutton West in Ontario, just below Lake Simcoe. And uh, there's some grade nine students. So let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, grade nines? Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, what has been one of the biggest things you've struggled with so far on your journey? Uh, I'm gonna, you might imagine. You know, I, I got to say the one that springs immediately to mind is the one that that you that you would probably guess, and it's it's political borders. Um, we live in an age when there's a tremendous amount of migration and movement across the world. You know, the United Nations and other sources say there's probably more than ever before since World War II. Um, tens of millions of people are moving around the world, voting with their feet. They're leaving, you know, areas where they're where there are wars or where there's, you know, economic depression, uh, they're running for their lives, or they may simply be moving, you know, from job to job across borders to seek better opportunities for themselves and their families. So we're living in a golden age of migration, but, you know, the route of this project um, goes through some pretty um, un unconnected parts of the world. You know, I'm going to countries and I'm saying, look, I'm not just flying into your capital on an airplane filled with tourists the way most people come and visit. I'm asking to come walk across some obscure border checkpoint way back on, you know, on the edge of your hinterlands. And then I'm going to walk through your hinterlands, places that, you know, very few outsiders ever go. And so many countries say, wow, you know, we don't get this kind of a request very often and, it, and it's not easy. Um, to sometimes get permission to do so. So that probably has been the biggest hurdle is um, I've literally been stopped on this project two or three times by the inability to get over that obstacle. You know, I've had to kind of literally turn left or turn right and again, walk around countries. Now, at the time, that's really frustrating um, because sometimes this can take weeks or months, you know, of negotiating, of sending letters, of making phone calls emails, all this stuff, and it still doesn't open the door. And at the time, I might be frustrated. But when I look back on it, when I look, you know, in retrospect, I think about all the amazing things I've seen on the detour, right? I wouldn't have gone to the Caucasus um, if ex Iran, for example, had not allowed me in. I had to go north around Iran. And the Caucasus are one of the highlights of my trip. I met extraordinary human beings there. Um, and I'd never really expected to be there. I never had, you know, as a journalist, as a foreign correspondent, the caucuses were way off my personal and professional map. So I have to say, I have to take the twists and turns of this long journey 
in stride uh, and take them as part of the adventure, part of exploring the world. Because again, back in the Stone Age, you know, our ancestors ran into obstacles they couldn't, you know, get through. And they too had to kind of turn left or right and, and pivot around them. And that led to new discoveries. So it's all, it's all part of the package. You may not, you may not like it in the moment, but um, things eventually work out for the better regardless. Good question. Thank you for the question. We're going to jump back online and we've got a question from Vermont and they're saying that you look great in terms of health. Have you had any injuries or sickness in your journey so far? Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I've gotten sick a couple times, but you know, I've gotten sick in Palestine uh, in the West Bank. I got walking pneumonia that was pretty serious. I had to stop the walk and go to a clinic. Um, in uh, Pakistan, I got sick once in Lahore that kind of knocked me off my feet uh, for you know, almost a couple weeks. But think about it. I mean, that's five and a half years of moving through really different landscapes, all weathers, all different kinds of cuisines, all kinds of bugs, right? I'm exposed to, to new microbes every valley I walk through. Um, and I think what's, what's, you know, knock, knock on wood, um, the advantage of the project, it kind of is unwittingly baked into this project is um, walking is pretty healthy. Walking keeps you pretty in pretty good condition. It's low impact, keeps your heart healthy. And I think the fact that you're moving slowly into new environments allows your body to adjust to new, for example, biological factors, whether it's changes in food or, or again, microbes. You're not jumping on a plane into a big tin can and then flying, you know, 17,000 kilometers in two days and then landing in some completely different environment that your whole system is in shock. And I think, you know, I'd be getting a lot more sick if I were doing that. Um, so the very nature of the slow movement of this project in a, in a strange way has been probably the best medicine uh, in keeping me healthy. All right, let's go back to Alberta and talk to Mrs. Pearson's class, see if they have another question. Uh, why, why do you like to travel? Well, that's a great question. Do you like to travel? Do you like to travel? Do you like to travel, really? Yeah. Good. Yeah. I think most people do, right? I think most people, whether you just kind of on a weekend, you know, go out to, you know, so, to a water park where you go visit relatives in the next town, I think a change of scene, uh, we like it. We like something new. We like to experience new things. I think that's really deep in our, in our kind of our, our mind and our heart because it's the way we, we evolved, right? From the very beginning, way back since the stone, you know, the, the stone age, the caveman and cave woman days, people were moving into new environments. No two days was ever the same. You know, this was before the invention of, of jobs that were, repetitive right you know they people weren't working in factories they weren't working in offices back then they were moving through nature and every day in nature is different or even if you're moving in the same environment whether it's a forest or a desert if you're out walking in it i can guarantee you and you probably know this if you go hiking no two days are ever alike and i think for tens of thousands of years we've been moving through this kind of ever-changing panorama this ever-changing kind of a movie of your life when, where you have to adapt to new changes. You have to problem solve something different every day. You know, you have to make a fire a little bit differently, or you have to find water a little differently, or you might have to deal with maybe a sore toe, or you might have to, um, you know, climb a mountain and see a vista that exhilarates you that you will never see again. I think that kind of variety in the human experience is, is so deep in our bones that we today continue to try to recapture that sense of wonder and that exhilaration by traveling, right? We don't have to travel. Why would we want to? I mean, we have, you know, if we have a nice house, it's comfortable, we've got all our needs met, water, food, uh, it's safe, why, why travel? And I think there's this really ancient um, yearning, this longing, this sense of wonder that's also wrapped up with curiosity um, that keeps us going out beyond 
the boundaries of of the ordinary of what we expect and um i think that's how we learn it's also how we test ourselves a little bit right good question all right we're going to jump back to uh, some of our high school students with Mr. Sinisi. Let me turn their microphone on. Hello. Um, when you're done your amazing walk, would you are you planning to document it and film a documentary on your amazing journey? Hi. Yeah. Good. A good. Another good question. You know, I'm I'm documenting pretty intensely right now through one medium, which is writing. I'm a writer, so um, my editor tells me that. Um, if you add up all the words that I've written, and as you may or may not know on our website, there's like a more or less a weekly dispatch. Sometimes it goes a little longer, two weeks. Sometimes there's like two dispatches a week, more rarely. Um, but if, you, if, you know, if, if, when he added up all the words, it's pushing 300,000 words now. That's a lot of storytelling. That's like three books. If you think a book is 100,000 words, I've written three books already about the journey and I'm not even halfway there. So um, there's that. And then I've been, I've been recording a lot of video, um, much more so since um, I've been using, you know, one of these. I used to have a bigger video cam, but you know, the technology of iPhones has gotten so much better um, that I'm using that to shoot most of my video. And then I also take, you know, thousands and thousands of photographs. I also record audio. So, you know, believe it or not, I can't cram in any more recording. <laughs> I can't do any more because I do so much. My days are filled with taking notes. Um, you know, I, I use these primarily, this ancient technology of a notepad and a pen. Why? Because um, you don't need batteries for this if you're out in the wilderness. So if it gets wet, it still sort of works um, as opposed to some electronic recording device. But I have dozens and dozens of those notebooks filled with interviews, filled with observations. Um, it's a pretty carefully recorded project. Now, if you're if you're asking, is like a documentary film going to be made? Is like a movie, something on that nature? Maybe. Um, I mean, there's been little pieces and bits of it that have been recorded uh, in that medium. Um, in the United States, PBS has aired a few segments about the walk. Um, I know there's a um, there's a guy who's you know collecting string on on doing a documentary right now in California. So um, yeah, probably there'll be some other movie type documentary type um, storytelling product, but I just haven't organized that part yet. I'm just so busy with all these other moving parts. That's a long-winded answer, but I hope it I hope it answers your question. It's a good answer and it's understandable. 22,000 miles is a lot to think about. You can worry about the other media when you get back. Right. So we'll steal one more question from online and then Mrs. Pratt's uh, group can, can have another question. And our fourth graders in Albuquerque are wondering about animals. So is there an encounter that stuck out with you or maybe a walking companion, something like that? Yeah, well, there's both, there are two kinds of animals, right? They're domestic animals, the kinds that I, that I, partner with to help me carry my equipment, my food, my water. And they, they've been terrific. I mean, they really make it a much richer experience. Um, I grew up in, in Mexico in a, in a community outside of a big city and the, and the community was kind of a farming community. My playmates were farmers, sons and daughters. And so I grew up around animals. I grew up around donkeys and horses and cows and I feel comfortable around them. And I've, I've learned how to manage them over the years. So um, animals, they become your friends, right? Um, they're a bit different than having a pet when you're walking, say, with a cargo animal through the deserts of Ethiopia, because they're, they're more like work partners, right? And there's a whole added level of um, interdependence that you might not have with a pet. You know, pet gives you emotional support, makes you happy, you, you, you know, you you can love your pet, but if you're walking through a very extreme environment, like a, a very dry desert in the Rift Valley of, of Africa, your camel is more than that. Your camel is your survival mechanism, right? Because it's carrying your water between places where there's no wells. 
And so your life, in some cases, you know, literally depends on your, on your animal partner. And it's vice versa. You have to take care of them, too. And that creates a really strong bond. Uh, you learn to start thinking like the animal. You start looking for grass at the end of the day. You start looking for water that you can drink. Um, you start learning about its moods. You start, you know, examining its body very carefully to make sure that whatever loads you're putting on it aren't doing any harm. Um, so you become very um, attached and close to these, these domestic animal partners. If you're talking about wild animals, um, you know, sadly, at least along much of my route, um, there weren't that many. And I've written about this. It's, a, it's one of the great, um, you know, melancholy parts of this project is how much we've changed the world to the degree that I can walk hundreds or maybe even thousands of miles without seeing any major big wild animals. Um, I can see wild birds. I can see, you know, lizards and insects. Um, but, you know, the big animals that used to be there back when the Stone Age people walked through, the people I'm following are long gone along much of my route. Their ranges have shrunk into tiny little islands called national parks. Um, and that's about it. All right, and Mrs. Pratt will give you a final word. Oh yeah. <laughs> what are the issues with water you've encountered? Water issues. It's, it's crucial. That's a crucial question. Um, you know, you can't go without water for very long. Um, I think the the biggest problem I had was in Saudi Arabia, um, where one day we had to walk about. Um, about 30 miles uh, to find water and through a desert. And it was, that was probably the hardest day of the last five and a half years. And we were all really thirsty. Um, I remember in India, I crossed a few months ago the Tar Desert with my Indian walking partner, Arti Kumar Rao. And at the end of a very hot day, we reached a village that had a small mom and pop store and it had the store, you know, had a, a cooler in it with cool drinks in it. And I just remember we each sat there and I drank eight lemonades. She drank seven. I think I beat her. But we did it all, all at one sitting because we were so dehydrated. Um, so on a personal level, water is crucial. You know, it's the biggest, I mean, that's the biggest danger. You can get really very sick and, and get in big trouble fast if you're not hydrated. And then the last thing I'll say very quickly is that water in general, kind of outside of my personal experience as a walker, water for humankind is a huge issue that's so underreported. Guys, I mean, all of us are going to face this problem. It's, it's really just under the surface. It's kind of invisible. It's easy to ignore. But here in India, 600 million, 600 million people live in some form of an extreme water crisis where they don't have access to water or clean water. Um, that's double the population of the United States. And we just have to find some solution where we conserve water, we use it better, um, and uh, it's not being done. I'm sorry to say, we're, we're kind of living in denial. Good question. All right. Well, a huge thank you to both our live classrooms uh, as well as the classrooms participating on YouTube for the great questions. Thank you so much. A reminder that uh, Out of Eden Learning, if you check that website out, you can find all sorts of activities and content that you can use in your classrooms and follow along on the journey. And Paul, as always, it is so great when we can connect with you uh, on your walk, and we look forward to doing it many more times over the next few years. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate this. It's always great to, to get the energy from the students and teachers. And thank you for, for helping organize these, these get-togethers, these kind of digital campfires. Appreciate it. All right. Well, let's turn the microphones on, boys and girls, if you want to say goodbye and thank you. All right. Once again, thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you so much, Paul. And we're going to sign off for today.